Mavericks owner Mark Cuban took to his Twitter to give his side, saying in part, the ref called Mavs ball. The announcer announced it. Then there was a timeout. During the timeout, the official changed the call and never told us. Then, when they saw us line up as if it were our ball, he just gave the ball to the Warriors. Never said a word to us. They just got an easy basketball, crazy, that it would matter in a two-point game. Worst officiating non-call mistake possibly in the history of the NBA. All they had to do was tell us, and they didn't. In a pool report afterward, crew chief Sean Wright disputed Cuban's account, saying, quote, initially on the floor, the original signal was, in fact, Golden State ball. As this can be seen in the video, there's a second signal, but that signals for a mandatory timeout that was due to the Mavs. Now, I should note that the NBA's last successful protest came in 2008. Jay, is this being made a bigger deal than it should be? Well, yes, uh, because to me, that was at 154 left in the third quarter. And if you watch the game towards the end, all you had to do was get two stops against Stephen Curry and you would have won the game. So, you know, on one, Stephen Curry snakes a ball screen and hits Draymond Green for an and one. And the other, Stephen Curry comes off the screen again and makes a clutch shot. So, look, it, this is always going to be a big deal. I, I also don't understand, though, Stephen A., why in the hell would they line up under their basket? That's the point that's confusing for me. If it was their ball, we all know how basketball works coming out of a, a situation like that. You're still running to take the ball out underneath Golden State's bucket. So I, I'm, I'm confused. It, it's almost as much as Mark Cuban is saying this is a, a referee, you know, making a horrible mistake. I put a lot of that on the players. Why are all the players down underneath their basket when the ball obviously was on the opposite side of the baseline? So if anybody should know this game, is even if you think it's your ball, you go to take the ball out. It, it, there's no reasoning behind why all five players for Dallas were underneath their bucket. Well, I will say this. The, the reality of the situation is that Mark Cuban is not wrong with what he said. It was an error on the officials from the standpoint that you're supposed to, you know, you did say it was, it was, it was Mavs ball. Um, and then obviously you changed and you didn't notify the team. Uh, that's an officiating mistake. No way, to, as far as I'm concerned, Mark Cuban is right about that. But where he's wrong is when he's acting like this determined the outcome of the game. Yeah, in hindsight, you can look back and say, well, we lost the game by two points. I don't want to hear that. You know, you had a full quarter and, 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 and plus, a full quarter plus to address the situation on the basketball court, okay? It's only two points. Like, for example, officials miss calls sometimes they make mistakes sometimes i don't recall a single game that i have ever watched where the officiating crew has been absolutely positively flawless they're not flawless the players are not flawless mistakes happen on both sides we get all of that but in the end this came down to their inability to stop Steph Curry. On one play, Steph Curry went into the lane, and the lane was as wide as Broadway on a Sunday morning at about 7 o'clock when nobody's out. There was no resistance there for Steph Curry's uh, to impede Steph Curry's layup whatsoever. The Dallas Mavericks have to look at themselves. You've lost five of your last seven games, okay? You're fading into the play-in, all right? Kyrie didn't play yesterday. A, Luka but did. This bottom line Let me is, just stop you for one, for, for one second. I just want to make sure we get it correct. So the officials made the right call. Yes. Yes, the officials made the, the right call. It was the pointed. announcer in the arena that okay. made the wrong yeah, yeah, call. I apologize. Yes. I just want That's to make right. sure we you have see that. The official point towards Golden yes, yes, State yes. ball. So right. Official and then, officials hey, got I'm it right. Here. Announcer in the arena got it wrong. Yes. Okay, sorry. That's right. the announcer, yep. My apologies. The announcer, that's what I'm, the announcer in the arena yes, got yes, the call yes. wrong. So, but what I'm on, saying is, what say. I'm saying is that Mark Cuban, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It was only, it was the third quarter. It was a basket. It's the equivalent of an, it's literally the equivalent of an official missing a call. And because of that, that assist and you get getting a basket. You might not have gotten fouled and you got fouled. You got called for foul and won for crying out loud. So what? The bottom line is you lost the game by two points. You had it. You were in a position to win the game. You couldn't stop Steph Curry when it really, really counted. That's what this comes down to. And if you're Mark Cuban and the Dallas Mavericks to make this big of a deal out of that call, really, really crystallizes how desperate you must be in this particular situation to point to that as the, as, as the reason that the outcome was what it ended up being.
I'm okay with the Dallas Mavericks being desperate. I'm okay. There's a lot on the line. There is what will Kyrie Irving do in free agency? What is the narrative going to be around? Can Luka play next to another superstar? They were originally at the sixth seed. Now this has them tied for the ninth seed. So there, there's a lot on the line here when you have several teams that are engaged within one and a half, two games in the playoff race, the difference between six and 11 or 12. So I understand the desperation and the sense of urgency around the matter. But the one issue I have a little bit with it is let Jason Kidd be that person. I, you know, it's one of the things sometimes, I, and I love Mark Cuban as a person. I love him as an owner. I think he's so passionate about his players. But, like, why the hell is Mark Cuban at the desk discussing at the booth, on the floor, discussing what the play well, is, looking at the monitors, hold on. making it extra, Stephen A. Well, let, let me Jason tell you Kidd why. do his job. That, 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 that's, that's like getting on Jay Williams for being cerebral. That's like getting what? on Stephen A for being loud. I mean, it, Stephen Mark, A. that's who Stephen he A. is. Now I'm saying that's who he is is I, what I, I'm trying to say. It, it's like if, if, if he's out of character, that's different. Mark Cuban has been speaking out against officiating since he became an owner in this league. We go back to when I, they were in the finals in 06 against Miami and, mm-hmm. and look at him literally screaming <laughs> in the direction of Commissioner Stern because he was complaining about the officials while he was sitting in the stands for crying out loud. Mark Cuban is no, he is consistent. I agree with, with you his behavior consistent. when it comes. Actually, he's dialed it back considerably over the years. Remember how bad he was in the earlier part of his ownership? Mm-hmm. I mean, this dude, you've never seen an owner going off on officials the way that he did. So it is consistent is what I'm trying to say. What would you say is the Grizzlies' biggest obstacle to a title? To me, it's, 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 it's the health of Steven Adams. I mean, you need that big body. You need that formidable foe on your front court. Uh, you know, I look at the rest of the squad. I'm thinking about Bain. I'm thinking about Brooks. Of course, John Morant, I expect him to be spectacular. Make no mistake about that. Uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. is just uh, reminding us of the unicorn that he is. He is a special talent. If he can keep himself on the floor and stay out of foul trouble, there's big things that's happening. I think that when we look at the West, uh, considering how Denver has faltered to some degree over the last several weeks, how we look at the Clippers and the injury to Paul George, um, how we look at Phoenix and, you know, the questionable health of Kevin Durant and how that's going to materialize. You've got so many question marks in the Western Conference. You can't summarily dismiss anything about Memphis right now with John Morant on the court determined to return to superstar status, the superstar that we know him to be. I can't rule that out. What I can say is that without Steven Adams, because we know Brandon Clark's already going to be out, but without Steven Adams, um, that that's a that's a big time blow uh, to their championship aspirations. But if somehow, some way, you know, he was able to come back, and I haven't checked into his status at all. If that happens, uh, you know, we, we we'll see what happens with them. I can't I can't dismiss Memphis. I'll tell you that much. So on, on John Morant, first off, I was so impressed, right? You're taking a couple of weeks off from the game of basketball, regardless of whether he was working out by himself or not. The fact that his, his rhythm was on point, right? I think a lot of basketball players look at it that way from, you know, does the ball, you know, are you loose with the ball? Does your handle feel tight? How's your passing? Is it crisp? Your feel for the game, is it slightly off by a couple of seconds or is it on point? Everything seemed as if it were seamless for Ja last night. I mean, the strong finish all over the two with two hands in the first couple of plays with the left-handed finish, the dunk on the baseline. Everything about Ja seemed like it fit naturally for him, and I'm glad to see him back on the court. Stephen A., I think there are two really big things here. Number one, I don't think personnel – excuse me, I think personnel is going to be a major challenge for this team moving to get to the Western Conference Finals. I don't see Memphis getting to the Western Conference Finals, and I know that right now – they're in the two seed without Ja and how they've been playing with uh, Tyus Jones and company. I, I get all that, but they're playing two bigs, right? Most of the time, they're gonna, if, even if Steven Adams is able to come back, you're going to see them play two bigs at the same time on the court, right? And we have Dylan Brooks on the court. Here's what scouting report's going to be against the Memphis Grizzlies when Dylan Brooks and two bigs are on the court. We're going to stack the paint. We're going to go every, under every ball screen. And we're going to force Ja to make jump shots off the dribble. Like, I'm hearing coaches talk about that around the league. Now, three-point jump shooting off the dribble, Ja's shooting around 34 35%. Teams are going to pack the paint. So Ja, when he turns that corner, he won't be able to turn the corner 
as well as he has in the regular season when you get the playoff time because of the way they're going to shrink the court on Ja. And this is not the same team. Desmond Bain is the one consistent three-point shooter. They're going to sag off of Dylan Brooks all the time, who is 32% three-point shooter, and they're going to force Dylan Brooks and Ja to beat them from the outside. I think it's going to be a major challenge for them. And another test, I think, if that happens this way, seeding-wise, as much as they talk about Klay Thompson, as much as they talk about Draymond Green, don't let them see the Golden State Warriors. Now, I'm not sure what's going to happen with Andrew Wiggins coming back. Like, there is a lot going on to try to understand what the hell is going on with Andrew Wiggins. Everybody seems to be so tight-mouthed about it, and obviously he's dealing with some stuff outside of basketball, and I hope that he's doing okay with it. Yeah. If they're able to get Andrew Wiggins back and GP2 second back, I mean, you hear Draymond Green talk about it. There is something that feels, even though their road record is not great, that is a matchup that I think they Stephen the Curry last two. and Clay Thompson feel like it would heighten their level. Like there's certain teams that you meet when you go into the playoffs that it feels like they can awaken a sleeping giant. And I'm not saying that Golden State will go all the way, but I do believe if they found the Golden State Warriors in that first round, that's a matchup I would favor the Warriors. Yeah, I agree with you there. No question about it. But I, I will tell you this. Number one, I'm glad you brought up Andrew Wiggins. Let me say this uh, to, to Andrew Wiggins, to the Golden State Warriors, and everybody else. You're absolutely right. Ain't none of our damn business what's going on in his personal mm -hmm. life. We wish him nothing but the best. Yes. Uh, we, you know, and, and it is absolutely positively true what Draymond Green said. It's none of our business. What is folks' business is when you come back. You know, we don't need mm -hmm. to know what happened, why you're away. It is our business. Mm. Well, when are you coming back now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Players approach you. you. know what I'm saying? They need yeah. you. Come on back. Whatever it is you're going through, you know, I wish you nothing but the best. You know what I'm saying? Don't even want to know. It's your personal business. But get back on the court. You know what I'm saying? Because, you, you know, you're still getting paid. We, we want to see you play. That's number one. Number two, I remember speaking to Draymond Green weeks ago, and I asked him a question when he was on my podcast, No Mercy, and I asked him a question about – the basketball savants, the guys that, you know, really you, you just you just their, you know, their level of intellect, their approach to the game, knowing, you know, who do we sleep on that's one of those brilliant savants that we don't pay enough attention to. I was shocked when he said Ja Morant, because when we mm. think about Ja Morant, he, we think about his exceptional play, how mercurial he is, the brother is just unstoppable, his athleticism is off the charts, stuff like that. Draymond was like, yo, man, that's a smart brother. That brother knows how to play the game. So when you bring up what teams will plot against him, what I will remind you of, Jay, well, you know what? They've been plotting against John Morant for a while. And John Morant in the postseason, when healthy, has shown up. He's mm -hmm. shown up, and he has shown out. Excuse me, a couple of years ago in the playing game against, against uh, the Warriors, last year before he went down against the Warriors, after, after Steph exploded, he came out and answered the call in game two. I mean, the brother shows up in the postseason. And on a personal note, as it pertains to John Morant and the applause that he got, first of all, of course they're going to give that because Elvis is dead. John Morant is Memphis, <laughs> not, now, uh, not Elvis. Okay, Elvis is dead, ladies and gentlemen. God rest and bless his soul, but he's gone. Stop walking around like he's alive. It's over. It's over. John Morant is Mr. Memphis right now. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.